months off the shelf with... Yeah, two seconds. Yeah. Oh. Two seconds. Okay. Yeah. Months off the shelf with... Yeah, two seconds. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Sana. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's podcast with me, Sana Khan, um, Fahim Zubair, and we've got a potential celebrity appearance by Dr. Ray Radford. This month, we were discussing the book. Oh, sorry. Uh, how, not to, uh, Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff. We'll just give you a little bit of an introduction to the monthly book club. We try and start at 8pm on the last Sunday of every single month. We try to make it an hour, but I think today we're going to have a little bit shorter just because it's a bit of a shorter book. And uh, as every single book, we can talk loads about them, but we'll keep to the salient points this time. Um, each of us choose the book on like a rotation policy. So this month I've chosen the book, so I hope everyone liked it, as we'll find out soon. And it's recorded on Zoom as you guys are joining us, and it's always going to be available on Facebook and YouTube Live. And we've just got a couple of ground rules. We just need to avoid interruptions whilst each person is speaking. That just gives everyone a chance to get their opinions out with loads of respect. Uh, we can have any drinks, but we avoid food. This is the only time in the whole world where I will not eat. And uh, it's always going to be free. We always encourage a, uh, a book club. So whoever wants to join the books at the end of this slideshow, we'll have a look at next month's books. If you guys want to join, that'd be awesome. And we always try and be punctual, always on time. That means starting and ending. And we avoid flaming, which is a new word that I learned when I started these, these book clubs with Fahim and Zubair. And that means just don't be inflammatory, be, be kind to each other and no incendiary language. And finally, disagreements are always done respectfully. I think we're quite good with that, to be honest. We're very friendly when we, when we disagree. And today's book is Don't Think of an Elephant by George Lakoff. It's all about the recent-ish American election and how the presidential candidates framed their words and framed their arguments. And as someone who's really interested in language and actually struggles a little bit when she speaks to people on a public platform, I mean, I can speak to patients, I can speak to people one on one, just get really nervous when I'm speaking to about 100 people at a time. So this was something that I wanted to read just out of personal interest. So I forced everybody else to read it with me. So let's jump in, I think. Just the first discussion points. Um, I think I'll come to Fahim first. What did everybody think of the cover? I found a really uh, interesting cover. I'll show it to people. Oh, yeah. So you can tell it's like uh, red, white, blue, the American flag. So that's interesting. Um, and then obviously it gives you an indication of who the target audience is. Um, it's quite hard hitting. Um, use of the black, white. Um, the stars um, is all good for in terms of actually drawing your attention and then obviously the spine with the red is great so I, I was really quite intrigued looking at the uh, the front cover and then there's these red um, rectangles which I thought was a bit of an optical illusion whether they're all the same height or something <laughs> I couldn't work out but, uh, I thought it was he was trying to be cool and jaunty by putting them as not perfectly straight lines yeah so so no I, it, it definitely makes you look at the book and pick it up straight away that's brilliant. What did you think of it, Isabel? I think I echo what Fahim said with regards to the colours, and it's obviously quite a, an American book, and that's made very clear from the cover, um, from and the the stars and the stripes that were there. Um, but I think he might also be making a, a message here about um, being patriotic as well. Um, I guess some might argue that. People that are liberal aren't very patriotic at times, um, but I yeah. think a, a book cover that is very loud and proud, um, or the slightly deconstructed US flag um, is quite clearly heading in that direction. Um, I think the unequal things about the lines, I think I counted 13 lines for him, I could be wrong, uh, but it may, it may well be to do with how different states maybe not be completely equal or not. Uh, and the other thing really was the, the title itself. I think the, the title kind of hit, came up to you with regards to being quite simplistic, 
obviously when you first came across the book, I think it was to do with um, the, 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 the ecology or climate change or to do with animal protection or endangered animals, but quite clearly it's not to do with that at all. It's to do with something very different. Yeah, it's very American in that um, the title, the cover, and the language used in the book, they're just not very subtle at all, aren't they? Like, Americans are not the best at subtlety. And I think that's what shows really a lot here. It's all about marketing, adverts, and um, just really in your face. Like, there's not very many layers to anything that we've seen, I think. Um, thank you for that. I didn't think of the thing about the um, the you know, the, the climate change and the animal protection and stuff. That was a really interesting take, actually. I bet, I bet a lot of people uh, um, were surprised about that. I didn't even think of that angle. Is there anything that you didn't really like about the book, guys? Zubair, what did you not like about the book? I thought we'd do bad news and then good news. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's the issue, I think, for me, um, in answering that question, is that it's not a book that I'm familiar with in terms of that sort of a book. I've not read a book that talks about advertising I would say before uh, and it's more about communicating on a different level but I think what it allows you to do is look at how people communicate uh, who are in that field and I think maybe that's probably why I didn't like about it in, in the sense that some of the concepts that were being portrayed were quite negative uh, yeah. it was a lot about trying to put your point up of view across to somebody uh, and denigrating or or sort of critiquing others and how they, you know, frame as to quote his words or argue their ways of or their or their ideas. Um, but actually, um, it didn't seem to be, a, in many ways, a positive kind of book. It, it was more about trying to fight fire with fire in many ways. Yeah, uh, that that was my the biggest sort of concern. The other thing really is he. Um, he's very confident in what he says. Mm. Um, and, and I find that difficult sometimes with books because there are things that are quite clear and there are things that are not clear and there are arguments for and against those those concepts and ideas. But he's very convinced in his ideas and he, he makes his um, scientific um, evidences that he chooses and frames those to kind of argue his points of view. Um, and the conclusion he draws do make sense of the way he draws them out, but they may not be the only conclusion that could be drawn. So that's the second thing. Because you might read the book and think, actually, everything he's saying is gospel truth, but actually it isn't. Uh, and I think the last thing that I would probably say in terms of not liking is at times he, he kind of veers off a lot. It talks about lots of different things and, and he struggled to figure out actually whether they were relevant at all in the book. I know he's written another book, which is a lot, more in depth and more intellectual compared to this. Um, and I would have thought that maybe he could have trimmed the book a bit more. I know it's a short book anyway, but I think there was more that could have been trimmed in terms of- Yeah, it was of, a bit rough at that time, so I know exactly what you mean. In terms of some of the ideas they portrayed. Um, yeah. And I find that a bit special because this is his second edition. So I would have thought that he may well have spoken to his publisher about maybe trimming out some of the things that were maybe unnecessary for this I book itself. Who can uh, locate the first edition and see what I chopped out of that? It would be good to do so, but I've, I've not read the first edition at all, so I've no idea what is in the first so, one. But thank you so much. That sounds like three separate negative points. I've, uh, I'd be interested to see how many, how what your rating will be at the end of it. Please knock down a point for each negative. Uh, how about you, Fame? Is there anything that you didn't like about the book that Zubair didn't mention? Um, no, I think a lot of crossover with uh, what Zubair said. Yeah. Uh, it just in terms of um, how it progresses, it just seems a bit like, like we said uh, off air when we were talking about it, so the collection of essays from the past all put together. Yeah. Uh, and I think you can tell that when you read it, you can see that it's uh, a work that's sort of uh, not, maybe not original, but put together of earlier works that he's done, which obviously is commendable. Uh, but it's just getting a, another output for work that's already got an output in a way. Um, I guess just the thing I didn't like was just how relevant it was to me, I guess, the relevance. Um, yeah, yeah. It's very American focus. We're, we're, you know, we're living in the UK and um, I don't think the UK really gets much in it, even like the companies that are mentioned, they're American companies and so on and uh, things that um, 
stand out in the American psyche and the, in the American consciousness as if that is everything. But maybe that's what the book's all about. It's just a, aimed at America. So I think that's the, the main thing is just how relevant. And you have to really reflect quite deeply as to what you can take out from this and uh, yeah. extrapolate and put back into UK life or UK setting. Um, it wasn't done for you. So I guess... Um, that's what I, what I was new. And I like Zubair said, a lot of the things that Zubair said, you know, it's a marketing advertising sort of a thing. Um, but those are the sort of main things I didn't like. Yeah, so I, I totally agree with that. Like, I think he should come over and do an English version. But the problem is, I think we have really different attitudes towards elections and stuff. I think Keep Calm and Carry On is very British. But... Um... Oh. But um, sorry, but my camera is not working. Um, no but, problem. <laughs> but uh, but the but the thing is, like, I, what I found is whatever happens in an American election, I think the news and everything sort of it lasts a long time on it. So their their elections and their media stories are very politically driven, and that gives it the longevity. And also, I have to point out, I've got loads of notes here about. It's just very, um, I know he's older, but it's very emotive and it's very emotional and it's really, it's kind of a really childish sort of view on the world. Like they use words like the strict father worldview, but whereas the, the opposite version, which is the version that he, he claims that his uh, parties are following is the nurture and parent model. And then he uses words like scary and punishment and hell. Like it's just stuff like that, that it's just, it just is not the most mature of takes on the world and I just feel like he clearly gets language really well he gets con cognitive linguistics and I think reading this book has really um helped him get interested in the area and I've wanted to know loads more about it since I read the book but it's just his his confidence in um in portraying these very sort of emotional reactions to the election results and the elections and and the speeches, he portrays it as fact. And I think maybe it's the healthcare professional within us that just gets a bit put off by that. I don't know, I don't know if uh, that resonates with any of you guys. Yeah, no, I completely concur with everything you said there. Awesome. So uh, did you learn anything new? I learned what framing was. I'd never heard of it before. I know off air, Ray does make an appearance. He actually, he had heard of it and listened to podcasts and stuff about it. I'd never actually heard of the of the term and to be honest I think off air as well Zubair was mentioning the difference between framing and spin so I was just wondering what you thought about that Zubair. I think in, in, in terms of the book itself there were lots of different concepts that I'd never come across before mm -hmm. um, which were really useful to learn um, and the science that he portrayed b behind them was also very useful to become familiar with. It it's one of those the reason why I like the book I know we've been negative about it so far is the <laughs> fact that I learned a lot of new things um, I hadn't come across framing before in this manner I hadn't come across some of the terms you use such as by conceptualism for example and even the whole element of, of strict father nurture and parent model we can critique his his sort of parlance but really the the reasoning behind them and the results of that methodology on the two parties, to be honest, made a lot of sense to me. Because um, over the years, especially last couple of years, there have been election results which I thought don't make any sense yeah. at all. Um, yeah. Because people were voting for things that I felt anyway that was against their interests. But actually reading the book, you think, well, actually, it makes sense. And he wrote this book seven years ago. So there's an element of foresight here from him um, mm -hmm. because the results that we've seen recently, especially that we can quite clearly see you're against people's economic and, you know, travel interests, etc. But people still vote for those things. But I, and I think I can see a lot more why now uh, compared to before. Um have read the book that there's there's an element of rationalism behind it uh, as much as I might or some of us may disagree with the outcome of those results elections but the, the other aspects Lord the whole element about framing and how that works it's a bit off-putting to be fair in terms of 
um, Spain and framing, but people do all the time. We we, we use oh, terms. Yeah. We use terms personally, professionally, all the time, and we met couch overs, especially here, um, because we may want to offend somebody, or we may want to have something done for us, or we may want to convince the patient of a particular remedy, for example. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot there that we do anyway, but now we've got a word for it and a term yeah. for it, and we've got. Um, I think the logical extension of it, because what we we may do, we may think it's morally um, correct, and we may feel that if we take it to the extreme, then it becomes spin, etc. But actually, why wouldn't you do that if you wanted to win an election or get something done or sell something or you know make your business work for you? So I can see why people would wish to read this book if i was in marketing or advertising or politics i would definitely be reading this book yeah it's like a bible and trying to understand the concepts inside here whether you agree with it or not doesn't matter but i think mm. just the fact that it's out there you'd want to read it and i know there's like it but because i'm not in those fields this book was new to me so although others for them would be like bread and butter for me it quite clearly wasn't but i think that's the beauty of the book club that you, you come across concepts and ideas that normally part of your professional or personal um, circle, uh, but it broadens your horizons more. So I'm grateful for that, for that privilege to have read the book anyway. Uh, yeah. but, and, and like I said, it's, it's given me sort of food for thought for reading a bit more yeah. around it to understand a bit more. Um, because at the end of the day, all, we all are exposed to it, whether we like it or not. We're all exposed to these things, whether it's on the news or whether it's on Twitter or whatever it might be. We're all exposed to it so it's good to actually know what's happening behind the scenes and what's leading to people to say what they say so on that do you think that the readership if they started reading it and start and this was i see this in about 10 20 years being part of some american curriculum what do you how do you think people would respond to framing or spin because i feel like especially on social media i think people are trying to become a bit more self-aware about how um, language is used in the media and language is used by politicians, even in Britain, I think. So do you think it's going to change the dynamic between the politicians and, and the public? Wow, who's that to? <laughs> <That's a laughs> <part of it. laughs> uh, yeah, that's a hard question, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, I mean, I just found it hard enough to get through the book, but uh, who knows about the future? But I think, yeah, it probably could easy get onto the curriculum maybe not like um school curriculum maybe i think a bit too highbrow for that but maybe a university curriculum or college as they say um but yeah i think it's, it's definitely a game changer for all of those and it's got such good reviews uh when you look at it so it's already made an impact um as you would expect with something that's come out with the second edition as well so maybe maybe we just haven't come across it as much being in the uk again coming back to that point but Maybe if I was living in the US or um, I was actually educated there, this would be, uh, I'd be much more in grips with this book, I think, already, which I'm not. Uh, yeah, because some of the stuff I was reading, I was just like, you need to just get over some things. Like, things just happen. Like, I think I have a very casual um, approach to politics, and I think he, they just have such an emotive one. But I think the book itself, actually, it re because he's written so much and he refers to so much of his own writing, to me, it was like a trophy at the end of his, his career, like... This is sort of everything that is done wrapped up in a nice little flag. So let's move on. Uh, so who do we actually think is the target audience for this book? I think we've related this a little bit in, in, the, in the first few questions, but this was something really interesting to me. Like, I don't know if he's trying to persuade people to get on his side or if he's trying to um, make his stance known to empower the people who are already, uh, would already be on his side, or is he trying to bring the two sides together? What do you guys think? Um, should we start with me? Um, I think he's trying to get both sides together because uh, near the end, he, he talks about ways to do that by showing respect, avoiding shouting much, all of these things. He Be calm, you know, they're quite useful for any kind of discussion at these points, not just putting two sides together, but just generally. Yeah. Red, hold your ground all of these sort of things so, they're like they're yeah. like rules. yeah so i think i think they're um basically universal sort of truths that he talks about at the end which won't be a bad thing um so i think it's meant for both obviously with his own leanings politically and so on uh which i think do come across in the book i think that that, that sort of gives you an idea as to who the book is aimed at particularly um and it would need someone of the other 
political spectrum to want to read about his ideology to get into the book, I think, uh, it's fair to say. Obviously, in terms of geographic audience, I think it's USA all the way. <laughs> for this audience, uh, I think it's for them, uh, an aim really solely for them. I can't see this having much impact in other parts of the world, unless you're studying US political history or, or obviously American studies, that kind of a thing abroad. Mm -hmm. um, then it makes sense. Obviously, politics majors, all of these sort of students in the, would be interested in this book, economics as well. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, met, there's lots of people obviously who would be um, interested in reading this book in terms of the target audience. Um, and it'd be nice to know who actually does read it. I mean, if we knew from the actual reviews because it, it's done so well uh, on the bestseller list. Um, That's true. So that does give you an idea when, when it hits the bestseller list that it's obviously hitting a cross spectrum of people and not just one group of people like that who would um, allude to that, I guess. And I think it has the casual intensity of something that's really quotable. Like I think, I feel like you could really quote it on social media. I think it's really aimed at the younger, more, maybe um, less sort of politically attuned young person. So someone who's probably studying, as you said, and then by the end of it, they'll probably either be completely against everything that he's talking about or be really for it. So I think, I think it really is, um, I think, I know his aim seems like it's to bring the two political sides together, but I feel like it's so confident, so extreme in the language. I feel like it's it's gonna, I don't think that it will have achieved that purpose. I feel like if I was on once, if, so if this was like a Labour Conservative type thing, I feel like this would have pushed them away to, uh, so much more because he's using very demonic language against the other side. I don't know, how do you feel about that as well? Who do you think would read the book? I think, like Femi said, it's quite clearly a book for people of a liberal leaning. I think that's his target audience mm -hmm. primarily. Um, I think if you were in politics in general or in advertising, I think I would imagine you'd read this book or try to grasp his ideas because he's a leader, I believe, in this field anyway. So you'd want to be familiar with his work. Um, he's obviously got a lot of experience in this area, so you'd respect his, you know, his experiences, you know, completely compared to uh, my experience in the area or anybody else's. Um, I think he's obviously um, tried to say things towards the end of the book that were very conciliatory uh, about yeah. respect, uh, about listening to the other person, trying to speak to, for example, the elderly aunt or uncle and trying to find out what was important to them and creating a bond and empathy with them. Uh, and then trying to be respectful of what they say. Uh, at one stage, he also mentions there's no point arguing with somebody who's really a staunch conservative, so it's quite clear that there's no point. Um, but he also says that be confident in what you say and be, you know, sort of hold your ground, you know. So there is yeah. an element there. Though. So even though, um, I know for him, he said he's conciliatory towards the end, he's still even then saying, well, but don't be a pushover. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so be kind and be generous, but you believe in what you believe in. And that's that's basically it. And so there's this element of um, being un un uncompromising there um, yeah. that I find with him. Um, so th there's that element there. Uh, but I think I think it's a great book in, in, in many ways, um, just to get an idea and get an understanding and appreciation of how certain people think. Um, he's divided liberals into so many different groups uh, that I'd never come across before. And I'm kind of thinking, which one do I fall into? And I thought mm. maybe not, maybe none of them, maybe some of them partially. You know, it's hard to kind of figure that out. I know Fahim's quite confident that it's an American book. Um, I would probably say yes, definitely for the States. But I think also if you're based in, you know, the UK or Western Europe, definitely, uh, and are left-leaning, I think this probably is a good book for you. Because over the past... 10 years, I would say, the argument for the left has diminished significantly. So there might be new ways of thinking that may well be welcome for them. So I think you'd probably want to be looking at this book and think, actually, um, are there things in here that would work, you know, in the UK or in Germany, you in France, for example, that haven't been tried so far? So I think if you're in politics in that area, then probably a good idea to do so. And again, as, as of before, if, if, you, if you just, if you want to convince anybody about something that you believe in, 
so you're arguing about something or you want to get a promotion at work or whatever it might be then there's things in here that actually would be good for you to learn it's some of it's commonsensical you, you think that's quite you know but for some people that might not be quite the case they might not have come across these concepts before uh i learned a lot like i said i'm sure those would be the same too um so there, there'll be things that you could use in your own personal or professional life which may have nothing to do with you know the traditional his traditional target anyway but can be cross uh, cross-referenced and, and used yeah, I know um, some sort of Islamic scholars actually recommend um, reading it because they say it's like a form of dawah. It's a form of it's a form of understanding language in the way that you can spread the religion because it's so, as you said, it's uncompromising. So whilst you're still respectful and considerate and compassionate towards the other side, you can speak to anybody all the way along the spectrum of ideologies, and you still are uncompromising and you're using language in a way that you're most likely going to get them to at least respect your beliefs, if not accept them straight away. So, so I think you're right. There's, there's some non-traditional probably audiences that he's never thought he's going to reach. So I know, I know, um, like Islamic teachers do actually recommend we read this book. And that's actually how I got into this book that I was recommended by my teacher. And it's because we're trying to understand language in a way that we can spread it in a way that's civilized yet, Obviously, all this sort of thing, politics, religion, all these type, kind of things are very emotionally sort of laden. And um, it's a lot of stuff that's quite abstract. So trying to put that forward in ar arguments that you don't need to get emotional, you don't need to raise your voice and you need to have a certain skill in, in addressing these topics. And I think that's, that's a really interesting audience that he probably doesn't even realise that he's touched, to be honest. I think that goes on to your last point, doesn't it, about bringing people together because mm. but there'll always be humans will always disagree you know whether oh, yeah. it's about where should go out to eat tonight or what's the, the better football team or to more pertinent things like you know what's what's the meaning of life for example so humans will always disagree so to have something out there where you can disagree with others in a respectful constructive mind is always a good thing um so i think in, in the book itself, there are parts of it where I think he's done that. He's tried to tell people that actually you can't disagree with somebody who doesn't believe in what you believe in or, or mm -hmm. has the same politics as you, but I think, but you must learn to respect them uh, and respect their points of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but also uh, try and show them what you think. Uh, and, and if they feel strongly against what you're saying, then maybe you can convince them otherwise. So he, he talks about certain things that doesn't he about how conservatives feel strongly about certain things like taxes, for example, or marriage yeah. or whatever it might be. Uh, and how do you let them understand your point of view in that manner? So you might talk about, for example, well, taxes make the interstate or they create the internet because no one individual could make the internet from his own back pocket. You'd have to have uh, a, a system in place from the government to get that, get that going. So I think he does do that. So I get where you're coming from in, in, in your point before that actually you know, there are things that cause human conflict and mm -hmm. there are things that remedy human conflict. And maybe this is one of those books that in some ways gives you the confidence to discuss what you might think in or believe in, uh, but at the same time, give you the option to be respectful and also the other person to walk away from meeting you and feel better about who you are as a person, uh, despite the differences they may hold with you. I guess that's really refreshing, isn't it? In uh, in the past, in the books that we've read that are non-fiction by these kind of influential people, whether they're healthcare professionals or politicians or anything, the ideas posited, they sort of the the aim for an optimum, and I think this is a really realistic way of viewing the world. In that you might not be able to bring the two sides together, but you can st you can still be staunchly on your um, opinion and your ideologies and your beliefs, but it's just a way for everybody to get along. So maybe that's that's the most refreshing thing for me in this book that we've talked a little bit about the negatives, but something that I really liked was you don't have to aim for a world where everybody believes the same thing, because like you said, it's just human nature that we just do disagree. So I think it's just refreshing that it's a very realistic view of the world that, and especially obviously when you get into a heated argument, your views that might have started off a little bit not conservative because that's the wrong language for this sort of uh, conversation, but 
sort of muted they feel like they amplify and they get they tend to get towards the extremes so I think that's the that's the nicest thing for me that he's he's highlighted that differences will, will always exist but there's a way to address them um can we relate his approach to healthcare as I know um Zubez you've talked you where you talked about uh, how we put a positive or a negative spin on uh, maybe positive or not so um, strongly evidence-based medicines. What do you think, Fahim? Have you ever used spin or framing? In my head, they're synonyms. <laughs> Feel free to um, contradict me. Have you ever used any framing in your consultations? Yeah, I think I think that's a good way the book talks about how you frame things in terms of persuasion, I guess. But at the same time, um, you, you do want to give the full information. So it's useful in that way. But in terms of healthcare, I mean, the book specifically has a short passage around page 60, 61, 62, where it talks about healthcare. And there's a bit I want to just read out, which I found quite useful. It says, if you have cancer and you don't have healthcare, you are not free. That's an interesting thing to think about because we're used to the NHS and free at the point of delivery. So again, <laughs> this concept that healthcare isn't free, I think um, can be a foreign concept to, to us here. But for, I think, from tens of millions in the US and over the world, it's not a free concept. You have to pay for it and so on. So when, when someone writes it like that and then go, goes on to say different things, ill health enslaves you, disease enslaves you, all of these sort of way, I guess um, the concept of enslavery and slavery is a, is, is a, is a very graphic concept, uh, yeah. particularly in Britain um, with, with its past, but uh, across the world. Even if you break your leg, do not have access to healthcare and cannot get it set, you're not free. So it's interesting how he puts freedom with healthcare, um, illness and uh, and obviously. So I found that interesting. It was a religious scholar who recently said he went to see someone in prison and he, and then he said, the only difference between you and me is that I live in a, bit, a bigger cell than you. <laughs> so I mean, it's interesting how people do about freedom, obviously a cell with a prisoner and then the wide world if you think of it as a bigger form of prison you know so it's how you look at the world and so that was quite profound in that sense of health care and freedom um so i found that interesting but yeah the, obviously the framing how you frame consultations is the other way and obviously he talks a bit about obamacare and you know what that means in terms of the affordable care which is the same thing and then when asking people how it meant so again it's framing framing what it is into how people do that and you can put that back into identity politics, because if you go back to page 17, he talks a lot about that people vote, not necessarily about self-interest, but they vote for their identity. That's interesting, yeah. because I think as healthcare professionals, often they can have their identity wrapped up with the NHS in the UK, as that's, that's your identity. Uh, and if you're critical of the NHS, well, we'll be tied you. So I'll be, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a bit like that. So identity, freedom, healthcare, framing, these are some of the things I thought were relevant about healthcare in this book that I took out of it. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially the prison thing. Uh, how about you, Zubair? I know you've spoken a, little about, a bit about this, but I was wondering what you thought about the, you know, the hubris and the confidence in this. You spoke a little bit about it, but can I just push you a little bit? So what have, what do you think about his approach to his ideologies and how he puts them across? Is this welcome for a British reader? Good question. Um, <laughs> well, if you're putting, if you're convinced of an idea, um, then one of the things you probably use um, as a trope to kind of push that idea would be confidence in your tone mm -hmm. uh, and in your language. If you're not very confident in your language or your tone, the individual you try to convince of the idea probably won't be convinced. So, for me, um, I don't think it was wrong of him to do that whatsoever. I don't think there's anything that he could have done really otherwise. It, for me, the the only thing that kind of put me back a bit was the fact that he'd drawn so many conclusions, but not given yeah. the counter, but not given the counter arguments. I said, "Well, I've drawn this conclusion, but actually, others might say this." Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, had a bit of to and fro. Um, that's what kind of got me because it was very much all one direction mm -hmm. and there wasn't really much of the case of, well, so-and-so is, you know, thinks this about my argument or I've drawn this conclusion, but there's this argument from a so -and -so professor and whatever else, and then had a, a bit of a discussion accordingly because that's what I'm normally used to. 
um, when I come across two ideas that actually you hear the counter argument too, uh, and then you might hear rebuttal from the person proposing their argument to, to those counter arguments. You get a bit more balance between things, whereas it's very much, this is the way it is. This is what I think, and this is the way it is, and that that's it really. Um, but that, but I think that works for people sometimes. People want things to be simple, don't they? Um, so if you're a mass reader, uh, or if you're not a, a politician or into cognitive science or whatever else, this book would help you to kind of be like, okay, this person is an expert in the field. He's read all the arguments. I'm sure around this, he's done it for for decades. I mean, in all fairness, he'll know it all. He would have gone through all the arguments already himself. Yeah, yeah. So you'd feel confident with him saying what he's saying. Um, but I think just the sort of intellectual side of me were just thinking, well, actually, it would be nice to kind of had the other arguments against what you've said uh, and critiquing your conclusions a bit more because that's what we're used to. We're used to uh, papers be presenting and then mm -hmm. the authors will say, well, actually, these are the limitations. These were the confounding issues. These were the biases that we had. And, you know, and you respect that. I think I respect that more because I appreciate that honesty from that person. Whereas he hasn't done that in the book at all. But I, but I appreciate why, it, like I said, if he did that, the book would probably be another 500 pages longer, um, yeah. which probably wouldn't have helped. Um, but I would have appreciated that more. Maybe he said that in the other books that he's done. Uh, but just this book, is, I'm just going off this book itself. Um, that didn't quite help me. I don't think there's anything wrong with what he said. I think it, it makes sense though, don't get me wrong. I think when I read the book, it, a lot of the things he came across didn't make sense. I'm not rebutting that at all. Um, but it would have just been, I would have found it more acceptable for him to have presented other arguments and counter arguments uh, for myself. Yeah, thank you. I think that's what I found, the difference between him and uh, people like Malcolm Gladwell and um, Oliver Sacks, who spoke, they spoke about their ideas that sounded quite new and revolutionary, but obviously they they did exactly what you were talking about. They sort of put it into the same sort of, because he's got quite a conversational tone in this book, and maybe he thought that he couldn't upkeep that with the, with the sort of toing and froing, but they did that really well in contrary to this, which was just sort of, this is my idea and just, this is just the truth. Like it's very, very declarative. And I think um, the, the word respect that you used really interesting because I think that's what made me get a bit put off because I think I like the sort of tentative attitude towards even revolutionary ideas because maybe it's something about me as a healthcare professional that things can change so quickly so today you can believe something quite staunchly and the, the next day you have to unlearn it all and um, having no counter arguments or having no justifications or rationales for anything just sort of presenting the ideas as to be taken by a possible I think that's what took me back a bit and I think maybe the readers might feel a bit patronized I don't know but I did feel a bit like that so um I was just like okay what would somebody else say well whereas Malcolm Gladwell Oliver Sacks they were brilliant at uh, saying well someone might say this but this is how we sort of tackle that argument that was really interesting for me uh I think we've sort of spoken about that last point and I think we've just got to time so does anybody want to do ratings who's Who's going to go first? Let's do I this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I don't mind, Zubair, unless you particularly want to go first. Uh, I'll just, I'll be quick because I'll, I'll be kind, I think, compared to fame. Uh, I'll say three and a half. Um, for me, that's something new, new concepts, new ideas, um, new field that I'm not familiar with. So that was lovely. Um, some relevance towards what I do personally professionally too um i understood things that ha i personally I understood things that were happening out there that i didn't stand before so again that was good um obviously we mentioned the flip sides before about other things about it being u.s specific maybe and, and that sort of thing but i think overall it's a fantastic written book um so uh, i definitely recommend it to others who were who were sort of inclined towards these things great um yeah i'm um, similar but perhaps less positive than Zavair on the, on the uh, uh, approach to the book. That's right. Good drama for him. Go ahead. <laughs> I, did, I did learn new things, which I explained, um, especially things to just reflect on and uh, 
philosophize over. Um, but again, I, there's an over, overarching theme of the American uh, concepts that are there, um, which for me are, are the drawbacks in not getting a higher rating for me. Um, and uh, so I'd probably give it a three out of five. So yeah, I would recommend it to others, but not to every single person I ever come across kind of a book, unlike the last month's book. <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. I would give it a three out of five as well. I was sort of inclining towards two and a half out of five, to be honest, just because off, I, I know off air, Ray was talking about how there are a few other books, podcasts and lectures and stuff that do address the same thing, but a little bit clearer maybe. So I think whilst I learned quite a few um, new things, I'd like, I feel like this would be the end point of me learning something about this or it's maybe it's the stepping stone to learning more about all the framing and all the linguistic features so who I, who I would recommend it to would be probably some English students, someone in, someone in marketing, someone who has a really deep interest in politics um, in the US, you know stuff like that or maybe trying to get an idea of what's happening and stuff like that so someone like me I had no interest in their politics but he made them sound interesting to me so I was really grateful for that but yeah I think um, I've got a lot to go on and I think maybe in about a year I'll love the book even more it'll be five out of five because off the back of this book I'll be doing loads and loads of research so and uh, learning loads more so I think I'm being a bit ungrateful at the moment but three out of five is my rating so thank you guys let's look at next week's book this is Voices of the Lost by Hoda Barakat Fahim do you know much about this book? Yeah so I, I think um a friend Mehran's due to come back and talk about that. Um, it's written by Hoda Barakat, and I think he's due to actually speak um, to the actual translator about this book and then hopefully add it on uh, as a uh, culmination when we actually discuss the entire book. Um, I've yet to fully read that, so I don't want to say too much, but the title says it all winner of the Arabic Prize for Fiction, so I think it's good in broadening our horizon. There's more things to talk about and um, I'm always in favour of getting more female authors as usual so that's great. Thank you very much and thank you everybody for listening and join us next month uh, at 8pm on Sunday the 29th of August. Thank you so much for listening. Take care and thank you Zubair and Thank you thank so you. much. Um, I just want to quickly mention as well, just for people, that we do have a, a special uh, appearance with the author of Consumed for September, and that's uh, with the Guardian theatre critic uh, alongside the author. So uh, even if you can't make it next month, please do try and keep the last Sunday of September free for what should be uh, hopefully one of the best uh, book clubs of the season of one of the most uh, awaited books of this year as well, which has come out. I think around June so that's something uh, that should be uh, well worth the wait as well thank you so much everyone thank, thank you